Hi guys, welcome back for episode number 37. I know it's been a while, um, so buckle in, it's going to be a very long episode. Um, so as discussed in a previous video, I've had issues with my camera just stopping in the middle. So one of my Kofi subscribers wrote to me and explained why that happens. And it could be because my camera is getting overheated, my phone, which I use, and so I might need to take a break. So I might actually stop recording like halfway through and then start another segment. Um, if I feel like my camera is overheating. So as you guys know, I went to UKGE, the UK Games Expo, which was held in Birmingham. Um, I guess it's pronounced Birmingham, not Birmingham. So yes, um, speaking of Birmingham, um, Peaky Blinders hit Netflix today in the US, the final season, and I'm super excited. I absolutely am obsessed with Peaky Blinders. So I know I'm going to be binging that tonight. Um, so super excited. Okay, so let me just get into the games that I played and it's going to be quite a bit. And um, as far as haul, some of the games I've played recently are a part of my new haul. So I will not again show you them again in the that part of the video. I'll just show you them when I talk about them um, right now. Okay, so let's talk about the first game and there was like a lot of games so I did not prep up you know um, like the way I usually do by you know getting all the links up in advance because there's just so many this time so I'm just going to type them up and uh, talk about them as they come up so the first game I want to talk about is Acropolis now this is one of the games I was most excited about um, at UKGE so this is a review copy I got from Hatchet Games UK um, so so yeah, so this is a game for two to four players. It's designed by Jules Massad, and the artist is Pauline Detraz, and the publishers are Gigamic and, again, Hatchet Board Games, and I got it from the UK um, division of Hatchets. And it is a city building game. Um, it's a tile placement game, um, a drafting and tile placement game, and I really like it. Um, so, so in this game, you're gonna have your starting tile, which will look like this and you're going to have a bunch of tiles laid out in the center and whoever is the active player will get the first pick so depending on turn order you will start the game with a certain number of stones if you are the first player i believe you start with one second player starts with two and so on that's because when you are the active player and you have this um you uh, in order to get a tile, so the first tile will always be free, the second tile in the row will cost one stone, the third tile will cost two stones, and so on. In a four player game, I believe there are six tiles always laid out because the active player always gets to go twice and the um, and then there's always going to be one tile left over which will get pushed to the front of the line and then you'll take one of the stacks that you preformed and then refill the line which is called the construction site and then you're going to be adding tiles to your own city so some tiles each each tile starts with a plaza a blue plaza which has a star on it and you want to get these stars in your city because that's going to be your multiplier for that kind of district. So here are some different types of districts and I think this will cover all of them. So red is like um, military. Uh, gr this gray one, uh, sorry that's not gray, that's purple. Purple is uh, temples. Blue are towns, like homes. Green are gardens and yellow are markets. Um, I, is that all of them? I hope, I think that's all of them. So they want to score in different ways. So you are going to want military placed at the outside of your city. You're going to want houses grouped together. So your largest group of adjacent houses uh, will score. Markets, they don't want competition. So you want yellows by themselves. Um, temples, they want to be completely surrounded in order to score. And gardens don't matter. Gardens have no scoring. Like restrictions and then so you will count up on which level so in order to get more stones throughout this game you want to cover quarries so anytime you cover a quarry you will get the number of stones that you have covered like quarries that you have covered um, however when you cover a tile it has to be covering two different tiles it cannot be one tile completely kind of like in Marrakesh if you guys have ever played Marrakesh if you lay down a rug it can't be covering one single rug entirely it has to be like two different rugs same thing here so you have to be covering two different tiles and you cannot have like a space underneath and then place something on top like you can't cover like an empty space um so yeah it's a fun game the multipliers are really important oh also the different levels so you can build up of course 
And the way it scores, like for example, let's suppose we were scoring gardens and let's suppose I had a garden on the first level, then one on the second level, then one on the third level. The one on the first level would be worth one point. The one on the second level would be worth two points. The one on the third level would be worth three points. Then I would total those together and multiply that by my multiplier, the number of green plazas I have showing. So for example, here's a green plaza with three stars. So let's suppose I had this plaza, then I would take that total and multiply it by three, and that will be my score for gardens. So that's how that scores. Um, yeah, it's a fun little game. So I thought that building up is the way to get points, but in the four player game that I played of this recently, the person who won had the flattest city actually. And I just kept on looking at him and I was like, I think you want to start building up soon because he wasn't collecting, he wasn't getting quarry, like more stone because he wasn't building up. So you need to cover tiles, quarries in order to get more stones. So I kept on thinking that he was going to lose, but he kicked everyone's butt. So yeah, so I guess uh, building up is not key like I thought it was. But I would definitely like to play this again. I thought it was a fun game. I really liked it. Um, it's very easy to learn, um, but you know, it's just it's a super easy to learn game if you if you want to check it out. And I think there are some variants. Um, so the player aids have some variants on the back. So I think the next time I play this, I want to do that because I think it'll make the game more fun. So yeah, so that is Acropolis from Hatchet Board Games, and I believe it's a new game. Um, so yeah. Uh, and gigantic. Or is it gigamic? I think we've had this conversation before and I don't remember. So that was Acropolis. The next game I played, oh, so I played this at a game night. I picked, I got the review copy at UKGE and I played this on my game night on Wednesday. Um, the next game I will talk about is, I don't have it because it's not yet published. It's coming to Kickstarter in October, but I definitely want to talk about it. It's called Cosmoc Cosmoctopus, Cosmoctopus. So, Cosmoctopus is a engine building game designed by Henry Audubon, who is, of course, the designer of Parks. The artwork is really cool. It's done by George, and I'm going to butcher this name, Doutsipoulos, Doutsipoulos. And the publisher is Stone Sword Games, um, and it's for one to four players. It's a, uh, so you have this like giant octopus who's like living in outer space and he like, controls different things and you want to like make like offerings to him to keep him happy like your devotees so let me just read you the um i'll throw up some pictures but let me just read you the descriptions devotees will guide Gus cosmoctopus through the inky realm a flexible configuration of tiles gathering cards and resources that represent relics scripture hallucinations and constellations by harnessing the power of these bizarre objects and experiences, they will craft a powerful card engine, aiming to be the first devotee to gather eight tentacles and open a portal to the inky realm. Um, yeah, so there's different kinds of cards that do different things, and you're going to be creating an engine, you're be going to be collecting different resources. On your turn, you will move the octopus to one adjacent square, and you can like mix, you know, it's gonna have variability because you can move around the squares with each game you play. Um, so you'll be collecting different resources there's different kinds of cards like some cards will actually require you to put the resources on top of them others won't you'll just have to spend them to add you know to play them and stuff like that um it's a really fun game i really enjoyed it um again i think it's uh, going to be a game that's going to be easy to learn but uh we'll have a lot more strategy as you play it and um yeah the artwork is just really really cool um I know that the game I played, uh, the prototype at UKGE, um, the art and graphic design was for some of the stuff that we played with was done by Henry Audubon, but it's the artist who's going to be doing it in the final version, I believe. Um, so yeah, so keep an eye out for Cosmoctopus. That was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. I played a three player game of it um, and uh, we played up to three tentacles. So the next game I will talk about is another game I don't own, but um, you know, it's a game that a lot of people have been discussing recently is Planet Unknown. So I did not back this on Kickstarter, but now I kind of have regrets about that. It was a good game. Um, so a friend of mine brought it to UKGE. It is designed by Ryan Lambert and Adam Re Rehberg. Rayberg. Um, it's for one to six players. The artist is Yoma and the publisher is Adam Apple's Games plus some others. Um, so again, one to six players. And this is a, uh, also a tile placement game, a territory building game, but you have this um, 
thing that spins and when you are like the commander or captain you are going to get to orient the spinning thing that has all the tiles in it to whatever direction you want and then each player will get stuck picking tiles from that section and adding it to their planet um, and yeah and different things will score in different ways there's like you know there's going to be like you know um, um, what do you call those things? Comets, I guess, that attack your planet and you'll need to put those out with like some rovers. You're going to be advancing on different tracks. I did so badly in this game um, because the way it scores is you are going to have like a grid and the planet will have like lo like dots at the top and like on the side and you're going to see which rows and which columns and rows you completed and if there's a fire or an empty space in a column or a row you will not score it. Um, so yeah, so I did very badly, but it was fun. It was a fun game. So if you like tile placement games, um, I know that people are raving about this one and I can see why. So yeah, definitely check out Planet Unknown. Um, and the boards have two different sides. So when we played, I played a four player game of this and my friend uh, did a more advanced side. I can't remember if the other person who had played before also did the more advanced side, but me and someone else who had never played before just did the regular side. Um, but yeah, that was a cool game. Um, so yeah, what else did I play? Let's see. Let's talk about... Oh no, I didn't. I don't have it in front of me, so maybe I'll, I'll save another game for next time. But right now I'm going to talk about Scora. So Scora is a game I played. I got a demo. I did a demo of this at UKGE. Um, and then I played it um, multiple times after that. So I play, I've played this maybe four times now, I think. Um, so this is designed by Rory Muldoon. The art is done by Rory Muldoon. It's published by Inside the, Bo Inside the Box Board Games and it's for two to four players. And this is in, um, this is a, like a hand management, like uh, auction, like I don't know if it's so much auction bidding, but area majority kind of game. It says auction bidding, but I don't know, kind of, sort of. Um, so you're gonna have these, uh, you're fishermen basically, and you are going to have your own set of boats. Like for example, there's going to be six boats per color. Um, and you are going to have a starting hand of three cards, which will be numbered one through three. And then each person will have a secret objective as well. And then the remaining cards will be shuffled and then some of them will be, three of them will be added around here to start each section. And then the rest will, you know, end up in your hands. And then you are basically trying to, um, it's a very quick playing game. You are basically trying to get like the best catch. Like these are different kinds of fish cards. So you're gonna have sharks, you will have fish and then claws. Um, so you these cards do different things so whenever you play a card you will do what it says so it'll it may say place one boat in the location you just play this in place three boats in the location where you just place this in take another catch card from the location you place this in and move it you know counterclockwise or clockwise and after you play a card you always have the option of of taking one of your boats and moving it from one section to another. And the reason you're gonna to wanna to do that is once everyone's catch cards have been played, then you are going to see who has the majority in each section and they will get the first turn in collecting a catch card. So like, let's suppose um, there's three purple, two pink and one gray boat here. Purple would get the first pick of taking a card from that line, then pink and then gray. And then you, after you take a card, you will remove your boat. And then if you still have boats remaining, you'll get to take more cards in that turn order. There are these tokens that you can earn if you placed a card in a section and the card just before you um, was of the same suit then you'll get one of these hatchet tokens and that will serve as a tiebreaker in turn order for the various locations and then you will see who has the highest score so you're going to add up the totals of your fish cards and then you're also going to see if you met your private objective and if you did then you know you, it's great you score that as well and then you add up the points um yeah it's a really fun interesting game it's very quick if you're looking for a really great light fillery game um, that plays very quickly that is fun um, highly recommend this one and the artwork is really cool yeah so let me just show you some of the cards so yeah i think you know i want to try playing this again um, at four players with 
more um, I've played it at three and uh, I have played it at four but I want to play it again at four and now that I think I understand the strategy a bit better because it can end up being that you have boats in a section where there are not as many cards as there are boats in that section so someone may not be able to get a card or you could have a situation where you have more cards than there are boats in a section because of the way people can move them around and stuff. So that is Scora. Um, so this was also a review copy I got after I demoed it. I asked them if I could have a review copy. Um, yeah, I, I like it. So it's a nice little um, quick game. The next game I will talk about, um, actually I'm going to skip this one. Let me just make these two in bold because I don't have them in front of me, but I'll just mention quickly that I did have the opportunity to play Bruges in the city of Bruges, which was awesome, but I don't have the game with me right now. It's in my suitcase still, so I will talk about it in next week's video, but it was really cool to play that in the actual city. Um, the next game I will talk about I don't have with me, um, but it is a published game and it's the Parks and Recreation Party game. So, you know, um, this, I don't know if it's been released yet. The year is 2022. It looks like it hasn't been released perhaps because there's no ratings for it. So I feel very lucky that I got to play it then. Um, so I had a tour. I'll speak about this more at the end of the video. I got to have a tour of the Funko offices, um, the European offices of Funko in London, which was awesome. So I got to demo some games there, this being one of them. So this is designed by Prospero Hall and it's published by Funko and it's for three to six players. Um, yeah, and it's a party game and I really liked it. I thought it was a lot of fun. Um, it's hard for me to remember exactly how it plays now, but you're going to have cards in your hand and there's different kinds of objectives that you are collectively trying to meet. You want to add certain symbols to these certain initiatives and you know get those and then in under each initiative card there's a spaces for you to add your token which like will determine turn order like who has the head seat for that initiative so you can contribute like different icons from cards that you have in your hand to the various initiatives and then um Whoever has the highest will get the highest scoring waffle token and the waffle tokens are typically kept upside down. But, um, you know, because um, the highest ranking waffle tokens have the highest kinds of points on the back of them. Then there's middle and then there's the plain waffles. Um, there may be some special cards that come up because there are event cards that would allow you to that would tell you that you waffles you collect may, need to be put like face up um, you know different events allow you to do different things it's a really fun game I really liked it like I am a huge parks and recreation fan I've seen the show like at least four or five times start to finish I think I'm a lot like Leslie no but I, I know that we have the same MBT personality type um, and yeah and I would love my own Ben Wyatt so yeah so um so yeah I really enjoy this game and it has a little Sebastian that moves along and he's the round tracker so I definitely want to get my hands on a review copy of this because I loved it and uh, they call it a party G game so it's not entirely party but it's not entirely strategy so it's a party G game and I think that is the perfect description for this parks and recreation party game so when that comes out I definitely want that so let's talk about ah here we get into some fun stuff okay let's talk about high society so um da -da -da -da. okay and let me just bring that up I say fun stuff because I'm not sure I have really super great things to say about some of the next games I'm going to be talking about so I love um Osprey Games and um, I stopped by Osprey Games and got to meet Benji. Uh, well, let me just talk about you know the, the actual relevant information. So this is uh, High Society. It's an older game, but this was my first time playing it. This came out in 1995. It's designed by Rainer Knizia, and uh, there's a variety of artists. So um, there's a couple of them. So I won't name them. <laughs> but yeah, this is published by Raven. Um, it says uh, Ravensburger, but I have the Osprey Games edition. So. Um, so this is a game, like an auction bidding game for, I believe it's for three to five players. Um, so I don't know if we just got super duper unlucky or what. So you are going to have, let me just try to pull them out because I sleeved them of course. I didn't sleeve the money cards because that would have been really hard and then it wouldn't have fit in the box, but I sleeved these big cards. 
So you are trying to, you know, bid on various things and you are trying to get the highest points at the end, of course. You're going to like, you know, bid on these cards that have different values. Some of them allow you to do different things. Um, and each person will have a set of money cards in their own color. Now, if you bid on something and you win, you will discard the money that you spent and put it to the side. After the game is over, after end game has been triggered, whoever has the least amount of money left in their hand will not even get to be in the running for the winner of this game. Um, so you want to make sure that you don't spend too much, but you want to spend enough to get the good cards. Now the game end condition, and I'm, I want to verify just because I, I want to make sure we did it properly. So there are four cards in the status that deck that have a dark green background, the three prestige cards and the scandal card. As soon as the fourth one is revealed, the game ends immediately with no bidding for the revealed card. Now, the game we played, I shuffled these cards and I shuffled them really well, but oh my God, the cards were terrible that came up. And I'm going to post a picture of what the game end looked like when we finished. It was ridiculous. Um, the green cards came up so fast. We had some really low like uh, numbers coming up. It was just a really bad game. And me and another player were like, what just happened? Like, we didn't like it. And I don't know if it was just luck by, you know, by chance, bad luck that we just had really bad cards come up. And it left, you know, it left me with like minus 10 because like I had a minus five card, but then the double card. So minus 10. And then, <laughs> so I don't know. I mean, it just didn't work well for us in the first game. I'd like to give it another go, but I feel like there needs to be some kind of a remedy if you keep on getting like really negative cards come up in the beginning. And then, you know, you need to figure out what to do about that because the first game we've ever played of this, that I ever played of this, I did not like. And um, I love the artwork. I love the Art Nouveau artwork, um, but I want to, I'm going to keep this one and give it another chance. But the next game I'm going to talk about, I'm not going to keep. So the next game I want to talk about is Inkling. So this is another review copy I picked up um, at UKGE. So this is a 2021 game for three to six players. It's designed by John Keyworth and the art is done by Quan Chai Moria, which I love. It's the cover that drew me to this game and it's published by Osprey Games. Now, before I talk about this game, I just want to say I love Osprey games. I love Merv. I love Crescent Moon. I love Odin's Ravens. I love a lot of their games, like the Undaunted series. I think Osprey games is great, but this was a huge fail for me. Um, I would not even rate this a five. And I am really baffled by the positive ratings for this game. <laughs> like, I just don't get it. Um, I was really excited to play this because like, I have seen, I've had my eyes on this game forever just because of the cover. It just looked absolutely amazing to me. And I was like, I just have to get this game. And we played a three player game of it last night and we hated it. Um, so you are gonna have like, I think you start your hand with like eight of these uh, cards and each person will have a word list and you are trying to arrange your cards in such a way to help the player to your left and your right guess which words you are trying to get them to guess. There are no restrictions on how you do this. You can like cover up cards. You don't have to use all of your cards. You can like use the letters. You can spell out words. You can do whatever. There's just like no guidance. And also the rules are just so open-ended. Like, you know, the game is played over three rounds and the rules don't even say whether you have to use the same words in each round or not. In total, you get only seven guesses to make. Um, so, you know, by the end of the third round, you, you know, you, you, you know, you only have seven guesses in total. But I don't believe that the rules even say that you have to have the same words, um, that you can switch up words from round to round. Um, let me just double check. Do, 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 do. Yeah, so it says, yeah, as many words. Your goal is to convey as many of your clue words as possible over the course of the game. Each round you may choose to focus on a single word or try and do multiple. But remember, you only have three rounds before the game ends. And the words don't even have like anything to do with each other. Like, look at this, like just completely random words. And you just have all of these letters to try to make your you know, neighbors guess your words and the words are worth a different amount of points, you have no way of knowing whether your neighbor is focusing on the same word from round to round, whether they picked a new word. 
and you only have three freaking rounds. Like this game was just such a huge fail for me. I was like, in terms of word games, uh, I think So Clover is at the top of my list. I just, you know, just, uh, I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, I just, I just don't get it. I'm, I just don't get the praise for this game I've seen you know in the ratings i just yeah so this is definitely being called um as far as my um kofi members are you know concerned let me know if this is a game you would like to win because i'm going to call this if no one is interested in winning this in a future giveaway then maybe i'll just give it to give it away to someone else like you know a non-kofi member um you know i'll just do a giveaway like that or i'll give it away to a local game bar or something like that but um yeah not for me <laughs> But, you know, maybe it is for you. So um, not every game is going to be for everyone, right? <laughs> so so that one was not for me. Um, but if you like this game, please tell me why. Please tell me, yeah, do you house rule certain things? I just, I just don't know. Okay, the next game I will talk about is, I don't have it with me, but I had the pleasure of playing it with Luke Hector from The Broken Meeple. And that is The Valley of the Kings. A really good deck building game and I cannot believe I never played it before. I actually own it. I received a review copy of it. Alderac was one of the first companies to send me review copies of games and they sent me a big box of all the games I wanted and this was one of the games I had requested but I just never got around to playing it but that will change now now that I see how awesome this game is and I absolutely loved it. Um, so yeah, so this is designed, so it's a 2014 game designed by Tom Cleaver and the artist is Banu Andaru and Guillermo Nunez and again published by Alderac and it's uh, two to four players and it's a deck building game and you are going to have a pyramid and the cards so you decide which cards you want in advance that will comprise you know the cards that you're going to be um, collecting and you'll put those in a deck and then you have a pyramid and you're going to be taking cards from the pyramid you know you will have a hand of basic cards to start with that will have certain coin values on them but some of them are just utterly useless you know they'll have different actions you can take on them so on your turn you're going to be playing a card you can like buy I don't remember exactly because it's been quite some time since I've played it now I played it like the day after I arrived in London so but I think you could take an action I think you could buy something and then play a card I can't remember exactly but I really loved it I thought it was such a good game and you want to start adding cards to your tomb because it's what's in your tomb that is going to score so there are some kinds of luxury cards and the way things score is interesting as well like you square the amount of cards that you have of a certain type i believe and then that's your score for the certain type of cards you have um but yeah there's like some take that throughout it as well so yeah i had the you know pleasure of playing this with luke hector and it was a lot of fun and i really really liked it um so i'm definitely gonna have to get out my copy and play it again the next game i played with him is alice's garden which I really liked. Um, so I'm an Alice in Wonderland fan and I will talk about an escape room that I did in Belgium towards the end of the video that was Alice in Wonderland themed. Okay, so Alice's Garden is a 2020 game and it is for one to four players. It is designed by Iquan 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 Quan and the artist is Eugenia Smolenjeva and it's published by Lifestyle Board Games Limited. I really liked it. It's a really good tile placement game. You have different bags and you are just trying to basically fill up, you know, the queen's garden, I guess, whatever. Um, so you have different bags and the different bags have different shaped tiles in them. And if you are the active player, you get to decide which bag you want to pick and then you draw some tiles from that and place it out. And there's always going to be one extra tile than the number of players. So you'll always have some, you know, variety. You don't discard anything. So if whatever's left over, you'll just end up drawing two tiles from a new bag. So you will always have or maybe you'll have a shape that's different from the other two um, and then you you know take turns picking the tile you want and adding it to your garden and different things score in different ways I really liked it I thought it was a lot of fun um, the game ends when a player can no longer place down a tile so you can also take a look at what the other person is putting down what shapes they have room for if you want to end the game quickly um, I really really liked it I thought it was a really good game very easy to learn easy to score just a great little compact tile placement game. If you are looking for a really good entry level uh, gateway tile placement game, highly recommend Alice's Garden. 
The next game I will talk about is, okay, actually I'm not going to really talk about these in depth. So a few of the other games I played with Luke were Fort with the Cats and Dogs expansions. I've played Fort so many times, you know, it's a deck building game, not really going to say much about that. Um, I like both of the expansions. I'd played with the Cats expansion before, but not the dogs, um, but the dogs were cool too. Um, we play, we played Wayfarers of the South Tigris. I will mention that having played with Luke, which was my second time playing, and then I played it again at UKGE at four players, which was my first time playing at four players, which was great. Um, but at U well, when, when I played with Luke, I learned that I had been doing something wrong, which was making the game harder for myself and my opponents. You can put meeples on the cards, not on the board. So when you use a meeple and you place it, to take the action that is on the board, the meeple goes on the card that is below that action spot, not on the board. So that way, when someone purchases that card, they get that meeple and they will get to use that meeple, that worker in future, in the future. Um, the way we were playing it, that I'd been playing it previously was putting the meeple on the board, which made the game a lot harder because unless you had a certain retrieve worker act like icon somewhere in your cards or something then you would not be able to retrieve a worker and so yeah so i made the game a lot harder for myself when i played with luke and with the first time i ever played it but then luke and i went through the rules after we played it and that's when i realized i'd been doing that incorrectly so oops but then we played it 100 percent correctly while at ukge i played with three friends and it was amazing i thought i was doing really well and i you know, I didn't win, but I thought I was doing really well. Um, but it's still a great game and I love it so much and I cannot wait for the production copy of Wayfarers of the South Tigris. And it's still my favorite Shem Phillips game, even, you know, now that I know how to play it 100% correctly. Um, so yeah, so those were the games I played. Again, next time I will speak about two games that I also played that I didn't, I don't have in front of me, but I, next time I will talk about Bruges. Um, and Pier 18. I think it's called Pier 18. It's a little card game from um, Alley Cat Games. So I think those are all the games. So let me stop the video and then I will go through all the games that I have to show you. Oh, before I do that, yeah. So um, I'm not backing anything currently. I am, you know, of course, still trying to save money desperately. <laughs> I'm in a bit of credit card debt from my trip and then from my upcoming trip that's coming up as well to Africa. So um, backing is going to be at a you know, very bare minimum. So not backing anything, but calling, I'm calling Inkling. So, you know, let me know if this is a game you would like and you know, who I should do a giveaway for, for this game. Okay, um, so yeah, let's stop this video and then start again. Okay. Okay, I am back to talk about all the games that I have received recently. A number of them are games that I backed myself, and a number of them are remaining review copies that I got from UKGE. So the first game I will talk about is a review copy that I received, and that is Icky. And this was on my wish list, so I'm glad I got to pick it up. There were some other games that I really wanted um, that I didn't get, and um, I was really limited for space, and I'll talk a little bit about that when I talk about UKGE later on in the video. So Icky is a 2015 game. I feel like it might have gotten a reprint because I, you know, I've seen so many people talk about it recently as though it's a new game. So maybe it's a reprint. I don't know. Um, so it's for two to four players. It's designed by Kuta Yamada and the art is done by Dami, Dami uh, David Sitbon and Kuta Yamada. And the publisher is Utsuroi and this one's published by... Um, well, I got this from Hatchet Board Games UK. I don't know who, you know, if it has some other publisher. I don't know. Gigamic? Gigamic? Um, so this is a, I don't actually know because I haven't played it, but it says it's an open drafting pattern building point to point movement. Oh, Rondell and set collection game. Hmm, that's interesting. Um, so yeah, it has some really nice components. I've put them into bags. Of course, I've sleeved all the cards already, but I'll show you some of the cards. <laughs> um, Oh, by the way, oh no, I'll mention it later, Ugh. but if you already watched this whole video, Scora, you definitely need to sleeve the cards. They are like very matte and like stick together. But anyway, um, so here, the cards are just beautiful. The artwork is just really, really lovely. I just really, really love it. Um, and let me see if I can pull all of this out to show you the board. The different player colors are nice. It's got a really pretty blue, purple, of course, which is my favorite, yellow 
red, a bunch of different stuff. I don't know what any of it is. Um, and then there's this, I guess this is like a player. I think each player has one of these and, you know, again, not played yet. So I don't know what that is. Um, more cards, a scoring pad, and here is the board. I'm assuming a different side is for different player counts. Um, that would be my guess. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, so this is Icky, which I'm really looking forward to playing because I've heard so many good things about it. So I really cannot wait to play this. Um, it looks like a beautiful game as well. So, but yeah, got a lot to go through. So I'm just gonna stick it all back in the box so I can get to the next one. Um, so the, the next game, I will I'll just go through review copies what's left of them. Um, that I got from um, UKGE. Another review copy that I got from UKGE is also from Hatchet Board Games, Dinner in Paris, Battle of the Chefs. This is an expansion to Dinner in Paris um, and it's from Funny Fox Games. But let me just see the designer's names. So this is designed by the Trolls. Okay, and it's, uh, the artist is Al Elaine Boyer, and it's Funny Fox and Hatchet Board Games UK. Um, so I actually haven't opened this, um, so let's see. So it has this punch board, um, has some little buildings it looks like, I think. Oh no, trucks, it looks like trucks. And then some cards. Oh, it looks really pretty, look at that. Mm, maybe I should just open it so I can show you guys some cards. pretty. So yeah, so I'm looking forward to playing this with the base game, which I actually have not yet played, so um, I really need to get on top of that. Um, I actually love the city of Paris, so I'd really like to get to play this soon. Okay, the next game I will talk about, um, review copies we're going with still, is Village Green. So Village Green is designed by Pierre Sylvester. It's published by Osprey Games. It says it's a game of pretty gardens and pretty grudges, and it's for one to five players. I really want to play the solo. Um, I'm, you know, I like a good compact solo game. Um, this box is super hard to open. Every time I want to open it, it's like really, really hard. Okay, maybe I won't get to show you the cards after all, but I found this to be the problem with um, great society or whatever that high society game as well okay I'm getting there I'm getting there okay, there we go so here are just some of the cards just pretty garden cards speaking of gardens I still have Tussie Mussie which I need to play or is it Tussie Mussie Tussie Mussie I don't know oh wow the backs of these cards kind of look like the backs of the money cards of the high society game but yeah, so this is Village Green, which I would like to try out and see what it's about. Um, yeah, I like this designer's um, other games that I've played, but I know I know that he hates me because he has me blocked. <laughs> but um, I liked his game, Brian Burrow and the other one. I called the other one that came before Brian Burrow. What was that one called? Um, it was also the UK map. Um, <sighs> I don't remember now. Last King of Scotland? No, that's a movie. The High King? I don't know. It was something to do with the king. I don't remember now, but it's one of his games. But yeah, I called that one. Um, maybe someday I'll add Brian Brewer to my collection. I don't know. I like Brian Brewer. It's a trick-taking game in area majority. Okay, the next game I will talk about, which I also got a review copy of, is Great Scott. So this is designed by David J. Clark. It's published by The Sinister Fish Games and it is for three to five players. It's a game of mad invention. Um, cards just look cool. I really just like the old tiny kind of look to them. Like I like old tiny look things, looking things. Like I like vintagey looking things. Um, let me see if I can pull out a bunch of other cards. Oh, oopsies. It looks like there's, I don't know what these are, like money, gold. Um, ba -da -ba 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 -boom. Oh, here's some cards with artwork on them. One second. I think I remember reading that all the art is was available to the public so that they didn't commission an artist. If I remember correctly, I cannot remember for sure. But yeah, I really like the, you know, the old timey look to it. So I'm, I'm actually looking forward to playing this. 
Um, and I believe that this was like the first game that Sinister Fish like published and you know it's the owner of the publishing company who designed it so um, so yeah so great Scott and finally I will show you guys the villagers playmat which I got um, from UKGE and you know a playmat's not necessary to play the game but um, I'm sure it enhances the experience and since I love um, you know Hakan Garter's games it was nice to be able to get the play mats if I could just open it. I don't know. Oh, here we go. Let's see how big this thing is. Ah, there we go. So this is the play mat for villagers. Very nice quality. It would be fun to get a play mat for Moon, actually. I hope that if they ever come out, well, maybe, maybe I should suggest that to them. Because it would be nice to get a play mat for like the draw pile, the like the the special cards that you're trying to get oh and individual play mats for your own space station that would be really nice with like a really nice moon background i'm gonna suggest that to them like if they offer play mats for moon i'm totally buying them totally totally getting play mats for moon if they have them especially since i think moon is probably one of my top 10 games of all time now i absolutely love it um, so let's move on. So those were all the review copies and stuff I got from UKGE. So now let's talk about games that I had backed on Kickstarter or received a production copy of. And the first one is going to be So You've Been Eaten. Now this game I was really excited about and I absolutely love this game. And then I was really sad because the production, the prototype I had to send on to another reviewer. And that was what I really wanted to keep. Um, if you guys want a really good laugh, there's a th really embarrassing thread I made on BGG yesterday in the forums, in the general forum section for this game. If you want a really good laugh at my expense, you can go find that thread. I won't tell you what it's about, but I was thoroughly embarrassed after seeing the replies. <laughs> um, so I was really um, excited about this game, especially because the publisher used my one minute video as the main video for this game. So to have my one minute video used for a Scott Alms game with a game that had artwork done by Quan Chai Moria, which so many people backed was such an honor. Like I just felt so, so just so happy that they decided to use my video and make it the main video of the campaign page. It was just truly amazing. Um, so I have the, um, the deluxe edition, the collector's edition, and you know, it comes with different components, which of course I've put into bags. Um, really nice. I love the dice. Um, the dark ones have like little specks on them. They look like they're really pretty, but this one is really cool. I absolutely love this die. Look at that. That's really cool. Um, it comes with little tuck boxes and you can decide how you want to put everything into tuck boxes. So this one com fills up completely with the cards of the same back. Um, so those are like the tracked cards. And it fits sleeved cards, which is really nice. So I am using, oh God, what is that? Sleeve King sleeves. And it just, you know, goes a little bit over the card, but it's fine. It actually still fits in the tuck box. So all of these cards with this back fit perfectly into this tuck box with um, sleeves on. So that's great. And then I have the other tuck box filled with all of the rest of the cards. Um, so some with this back and then the player aids and stuff like that and some other like event cards or whatever. Um, then this one I have filled with different various components. Um, and of course I'm a compulsive bagger so I still put them in bags. But it has like the crystals which are really cool. It has these like little player pieces and like some expansion pieces. Um, so I put those in this box. I want some other pieces as well. And then, of course, this game comes, I didn't realize, but it comes with a dice tower. Um, it does not fit into the box assembled, so you will need to reassemble it if you want, but I'm not gonna use the dice tower, to be honest. I don't really care about that. Um, and then the board, which you will also need to assemble when you play it. So yeah, I'm super excited for this game, like really, really excited. And I'm gonna try playing it solo. So very glad to have this game in my possession. Um, and the next thing I will talk about, just put this away. So yeah, if you want a good laugh at my expense to so go to the BGG forums for this game. Okay, <laughs> so the next one I will talk about is Backyard Chickens. So Backyard Chickens is a game. Oh, 
That's funny. It's another game in which they use my one minute video as the main video of the campaign. Um, yeah, so that's pretty cool. The designer no longer follows me because, you know, I'm a horrible human being apparently, but whatever. <laughs> okay, so, um, so yeah, so this game I actually upgraded with eggs from Stonemaier Games. So it has player colors purple, blue, green, and they didn't have red eggs, but these pink ones are close enough. So red, oh, and yellow which I use like the kind of cream colored ones. And then, you know, this insert has um, spaces for all of the cards, um, the water tokens. Um, I left the cardboard eggs, left I, I left them in their punch boards and just stuck it underneath the insert because I don't need those since I upgraded it with these nice eggs. Um, and yeah, and then all the chicken cards. So let me just show you some of the chicken cards. Where are the chickens? And like just you know some of the cards you can buy from the market it's a really great deck building game by the way it's, it's really good um, but yeah some of the chickens and then event cards so i think the next time i play i want to play with event cards because i actually have not played this game with event cards yet so i would like to do that oh and then the individual player boards well i think what you know i know they probably wanted to keep production costs to a minimum and uh, the price point for this game to a minimum but um you do have to keep a certain token on here and then you need to um then there's a token for something else i can't remember but you know i guess you don't really need it but some you know part of me was like oh it would have been nice if it was a dual layered board so the token just fits in nicely because if you accidentally flick it like you might not remember where it went but not a big deal like not everything needs to be like overproduced i guess so yeah so this is a really nice uh uh, deck building game. If you like deck building games, I highly recommend it. Backyard Chickens. So I received my production copy of that. The next two games are games that I backed on Kickstarter. So I got my Spirits of the Forest Moonlight, which is the expansion to this game. Um, so I backed these on Kickstarter and I'm so excited. They are just so beautiful. One thing I don't understand is why this has a sleeve. Like honestly, I don't understand why people want sleeved uh, sleeves for their boxes because you know you have to push it out and I think over time it'll just be get loosened and it'll just be annoying so I think I would have just been happy with the box by itself like this isn't sleeved so and it's really pretty so I don't understand why this is sleeved but okay um so when you open it up it's got gorgeous you know it's, it's absolutely gorgeous it just yeah so this is the deluxe edition I you know I'm not gonna explain how to play the game because I've played it so long ago and I don't remember, but me and my little sister played like, I think like three or four games of this in a row one time and we absolutely loved it. Um, oh, this rule book is so nice, by the way. It smells so good and the paper is just so nice. I love the feeling of this paper. I don't know what material it's called, but it's kind of like a really nice matte paper and I just love it so much. I just love the material of this rule book. It's so nice. So, so nice. Okay, so inside this box, you will see the player eggs. You will see all the tiles, which are freaking amazing. So let me just show you a couple of them. These tiles are so nice. I think they had like paint just like put on them. Like they feel like they've been like, like it feels like the ink just somehow, I don't know. They're just so freaking nice. I just love them. I love these tiles so freaking much. They're so nice. I cannot play, wait to play with my deluxe edition of this. Um, I already sleeved all the cards. So let me just show you some of the, like, the different cards. Um, there's not much on them to see, but those are the cards. Okay, and then it has like a bunch of tokens. Like, let me just bring out a bunch. So these are the tokens, which also have really nice like artwork painted on them. Um, and this one comes with like some firefly expansion. So it comes with these little metal fireflies or maybe they're butterflies, sorry. I think they might be butterflies. Little, And then it has this coin, which I don't know what this is, but it's pretty. But yeah, I am in love with this game. Just, you know, I haven't even played with my deluxe yet, but I already absolutely love it so freaking much and just cannot wait to play this. Um, so yeah, so that is that. And then in the expansion box, I stuck the special purple eggs that I had gotten. So let me just put this back in the sleeve. Oh, so sorry, I should probably mention the publisher names in case you guys want to find these. So this is published by Thunder Griff Games. Um, 
So if you're interested, I don't know if it'll still be available, but it is a really great game. It's for one to four players. I've only ever played it two player. Um, and here is the expansion. I would be interested in playing this in a fire player account. So this one, oh, I have to show you the tiles because the tiles are so freaking nice. Um, but here are my special purple eggs. I, didn't, I, I did put them in the box before because you're probably wondering like, why didn't I just put the purple eggs in the main box? They don't fit in the compartments. And then I didn't want to substitute one of the other colors with the purple because the finish on these eggs is different. The finish on this egg seems shiny while the finish on those eggs seem matte. So I didn't like the fact that they weren't matching. So, so that's why I decided to keep them in this box. Um, but check out this absolutely stunning art. Ugh, this is just, these tiles are just so freaking beautiful. I just love them so much. So yeah. So this is the expansion. Oh, they're just so amazing. Just love them. Oh my God, they're just so beautiful. Oh, look at this one. Yeah, love it. So yeah, I cannot wait to play with this. There's some other, there's two other tiles in here as well and then some cards, but yeah. And it comes with the rule book for the expansion. So cannot wait to play with this. Then I backed, and this is one of my Kickstarter regrets. I don't know why I backed it. It's like, I honestly do not know why. Um, FOMO, I think Letter Games is really good at getting me with FOMO because I backed Oath when I knew it probably wasn't a game that I would ever play and as soon as I got it, stupid me spent time sleeving every single card and then I sold it on. So I did all the hard work for someone else by punching everything out, sleeving all the cards and then selling it on. So I did all the hard work for them. Okay, so, so I backed these and I don't know why. I just do not know why I backed these and this. So, so this I'm gonna keep. I like the cat. Um, so whenever I've played, I think I've been the cat once or twice, the marquee cats. Um, I can't remember what other factions I've played as. I do have the base game. I've never played with my copy of the base game. Whenever I've played this game, I've played with a copy of someone who's in my game group. And I think I backed these just because they looked so cute. Um, I'm a sucker for the artwork, but I'm really regretting it now because I've never even played with my own copy of the game. So I'm wondering what I should do about this. Maybe I'll just sell it on. I don't know. I don't, I don't know what to do but that's another Kickstarter regret. But I'm very proud of myself for not having backed ARCs. You know, ARCs is currently on Kickstarter or maybe it finished, I don't know. Um, and it's, you know, by Letter Games, it's a deck building, trick-taking game. Um, and, you know, I've been on a really, like a trick-taking, like, kick lately. Um, and I find that I actually really like trick-taking games and ARCs, like, takes place in outer space and the artwork is done by Kyle Farron. So, you know, the FOMO was really getting to me, but, um, you know, if you want to go all in on ARCs, it's pretty expensive. And I was worried it would just be another oath situation for me where once the game arrives, I regret it and I sell it on. And since I'm super tight on money, I just decided not to back it. So yeah, so I don't know what I'm going to do with this. Maybe I'll sell it on. I don't know. Or, I don't know. Maybe I'll do a giveaway for my Kofi backers with it. I don't know yet. Um, the next game that arrived, I don't know if I should show you or not because he, um, the designer may pull the Kickstarter and then launch it again at another time. So I'm, you know, I, I don't know if I'll open the box for you guys right now, but this is Dino Sitters. This is by the same designer as Winter Haven Woods and the, he does the artwork himself, which I absolutely love. Um, yeah, and I really love the artwork for Winter Haven Woods and it was actually a really good game as well, which I really liked. So, so yeah, he wanted me to cover this game and it comes, you know, he has like these little dinosaurs in it, which are cute. The artwork is really pretty. It has like a watercolory look to it, um, but this is like a prototype edition. So, um, but we'll see whether or not I cover this soon or not. We'll see. So those are all the games I received. So I think I can go on and talk about my trip to UKGE. But before I do that, I'm going to end this video in case it stops recording. So let me shut it off and then come back. Okay, welcome back for the last segment of this video where I will talk about my trip to London, Bruges, Brussels, and UKGE. So I went to London for like about 11 days. Well, two days of those were spent in Belgium. Um, so, you know, um, it was amazing. <laughs> so, like I lived in London for close to three years. So whenever I go back, 
it always feels like home it, it, you know it feels like being in a second home i feel like a natural there like i know my way around i know my way around better than some than some londoners actually so so like i'll be the one giving directions to people who actually live in the city um it's crazy um so you know i'll tell people how to get around on the tube and the dlr um so yeah so i absolutely love london i adore it um you know i know a lot of the great places to eat and the you know museums that people should check out if they haven't been to the city but like you know like the under the radar kind of stuff anyway so i went there um the first day you know i met up with a friend um, and had lunch with her but then the second day I met up with Luke Hector so he was worried about where should we meet to play board games so one of my favorite places to go in London is Foyle's bookstore on Charing Cross Road um, they used to have an old location which when I lived in London they had built the new location like just before I think I moved um, the old location was like really old and then they built this amazing new location just a couple like I don't know 100 feet or whatever down the road on Charing Cross Road and it is amazing it's got five floors well six because in england the ground floor is always called zero and then they go one two three four five um so on the fifth floor there is a cafe and it has amazing tables like really large tables so i don't know the first thing i always do when i get to london is to go to foils like i'm obsessed with that bookstore so i went there i scoped out the cafe area and i was like yeah it's just like i remember it It has big tables so i asked luke from broken meeple to meet me there and we got a big table had some really good food from the cafe they have amazing cakes and actual real good food too if you want to eat it um yeah they had a really good salad their potato salad was so good um so yeah so we sat there ate food and played games so that was a lot of fun. It was really fun. Sorry, I have like a bit of congestion. <clears throat> it was really fun to meet Luke from uh, YouTube, The Broken Meeple. Um, and just, you know, it was just really great to meet him and play games. So that was great. Um, then what? Then, oh yeah, the Funko Tours. Uh, the Funko Tour was awesome. So I am friends with uh, Stefan Brassad. He used to be the president of Gamma. And now I think he is the treasurer. Uh, he used to work with Yellow Games and now he is with Funko. And so I was able to get a tour of the offices, which were amazing. Oh my God, I'll throw up some pictures here, but um, like the giant Funko sculptures, so freaking cool just to see all the walls with all of the Funkos, which they apparently change up. They also bought Lounge, Loungefly, which I'm a huge fan of Loungefly. I have a couple of their backpacks. I have their wallet. Um, I have a Grogu wallet from Loungefly. <laughs> um, yeah, um, and yeah, I have like a Harry Potter. I think I have two, no, I have one Harry Potter bag and one Star Wars bag lounge fly yeah but that was really cool got to demo some games talk to him about what's upcoming you know i got to sneak peek some stuff that's top secret that i cannot share with you guys but that was really really cool so it was really cool to get a tour of the funko offices um ukge was a great experience um one thing i like about europeans is i feel like they are like all about the games you know they don't care about the drama that exists in the board gaming world in america like it's all about the games no one gives a shit about anything else it was really nice to be there you know even get recognized by a couple of people who wanted selfies with me which was really just awesome like it's still surreal that you know people want a picture with me <laughs> so um that was really cool it was nice to meet up with a bunch of publishers you know check out dronda games they have some upcoming games which i'm really excited about um, and of course, um, Stone Sword games, you know, checked out a bunch of different booths. I didn't get, uh, there was three games that I really wanted to review copies of, which I did not get because, oh God, bringing back the games would, would, would be really difficult, I knew. So um, I wanted review copies of First Rat from Pegasus Spiel. I wanted a review copy of Yak. I don't remember the publisher's name. And of course, Get On Board London and New York, I think, or is it, Paris? is it London and Paris? I can't remember, but the Roll and Write game from Yellow Games, I really wanted that as well. So those three I did not get, um, but you know, I think I might contact the publishers to see if I'm able to get review copies of those. Um, First Rat looks really cool. Um, so yeah, so UKGE was awesome. I did have a bad experience there. Um, so prior to so as you all know i was really looking forward to interviewing hakan garter from um the designer of 
Moon and Streets, like two of my favorite games ever. Um, so prior to going to UKGE, I had purchased a used camera because I was like, I need to upgrade my equipment. I need a proper camera for which I can shoot proper playthroughs. And so I had bought a used camera from a friend. She said it was like new. So, and I'm familiar with cameras. Uh, I've taken photography courses. I actually have a digital SLR camera. I even have a film SLR camera. You know, I've had a number of digital cameras throughout my life. So um, Canon is the brand I typically work with. Um, so both of my, like all of my cameras that I have right now are Canon. Um, I have worked with Nikon in the past as well, but I'm not unfamiliar with cameras. So I know how to work cameras and the different settings. I know what aperture is. I know how to uh, set aperture and shutter speed. I know how to make photographs look the way I want to. Like I studied all of that in photography courses that I took. Um, so I bought this used camera and unfortunately when I did a quick test at home, it worked fine. So I decided an hour before my interview with Hakan Garter, I would, you know, scope out a location for us to, you know, do the interview and I would test the camera and get the settings ready. Uh, the viewfinder, the panel stopped working and then I reached out to the friend who I bought this camera from to let her know what happened and it was just a very frustrating experience where i think she felt that i don't know how to use cameras she just kept on telling me did you try this did you try this did you try this and i'm like yes 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 like i've tried everything like every suggestion you have i've tried trust me i've i've done everything i can do you know um so and then eventually not only did the panel stop working the viewfinder stopped working so if you looked in the viewfinder you could no longer like adjust the settings you couldn't see anything even from the viewfinder so the camera just basically didn't work so i was a mess um you know the whole hour i was going to spend preparing for this interview was wasted trying to get this camera to work it was wasted crying and talking to this friend on the phone who was very agitated and upset it seemed um and I let her know I wanted to return it because I'm not the original purchaser of this camera. I don't have the original receipt. I, you know, don't have the warranty. Like if she, if she can do something about it, she would be able to. And, you know, just like I bought it, maybe she could get it checked out, see if there's some faulty connection and then return it or do whatever she needs to and then sell it on. Like she sold it to me once it's fixed. So anyway, so the camera wasn't working, so I was going to ask Hakan if I could conduct the interview the next day so that I could bring proper equipment for my phone. Because I had gone to this convention with a tripod for the camera, not for my phone. Um, so I met with Hakan and I asked him, but he said, no, let's just do the interview because, you know, he had set aside an hour's time to meet with me. We weren't going to take an hour, but still. So I was like, okay. So, you know, at this point I had puffy eyes because I'd been crying. I was very frustrated. It was not a good experience. And so now we had to do an interview on my phone, which I did not have a stand for because I didn't realize I'd be interviewing on my phone and all my interview notes were on my phone. So I couldn't refer to my interview notes during the interview since now we were using my phone. I am not happy with the quality of the interview, so I'm not sure if I want to use it in the end. Um, just that was just very disappointing. Like it would have been so amazing to have an in-person interview with one of my favorite designers of all time. Um, but I'm not happy with the way the interview turned out looking at it. So I'm still trying to decide whether or not I want to go ahead and post that one or just do a video chat interview. I don't know. Um, so that was really disappointing. So that was the disappointing experience of UKGE for me. Um, yeah, so since then I've returned the camera to someone, to the friend. Um, I tested it once I got home, like, so I tested it that night again when I got back to my Airbnb, tested it the next day, still wasn't working. Then days later, when I arrived back in America, I decided to test it again, and of course it's working, but I've already purchased another camera, um, and it cost me a lot of money, <laughs> so, you know, I bought a new camera now, and I bought the more later, like the latest model of this camera, because I'm going to use it in Africa as well for my photography of the safaris and everything. And if I shoot any kind of content, board game content in South Africa, I will, you know, use the camera. So, and of course I'm going to be using it for playthroughs. So we'll see. My new camera is due to arrive tomorrow, but I won't have it in my position until Monday. So, um, because it's being delivered to my mom's house. 
So yeah, so that was a disappointing experience, um, but it was really great to meet Hakan. He is so kind, and just by happenstance, I got to meet him again the next day and have lunch with him. So me and my friend were, we decided the next day, oh my god, it was so freaking cold. It was freezing. Um, so I decided I did not want to go out to the food truck since it was so cold and rainy, and I was like, I'll just eat in the convention center. So we ended up going to this pizza place, and we saw Hakan sitting at a table, and he offered me and my friend to sit with him and we did and we chatted with him which was great and he even asked about my board game design so you know to have one of your favorite board game designers ask about your own board game design and take an interest in it was just really awesome um, he's such a wonderful person he is so kind he is just and just brilliant um, and you know the fact that he does his own graphic art and artwork for his games just really really cool so yeah it was just really awesome meeting Hakan um, and I was able to get a second picture with him on the second day since the first day I had like puffy eyes and I didn't like the way I looked uh, so yeah so that was great I got to meet you know other content creators I got to meet Mark Monk from TikTok I love his videos um, he does these amazing transitions uh, he goes by the name Ninja Geek, so if you're looking for him, he's Ninja Geek on Instagram and YouTube, I believe, and TikTok. So yeah, so he does these videos with these awesome transitions, which I really, really love. So it was just really fun to meet him. We, we were, he was supposed to play Wayfarers with us, but unfortunately, he, I think he was in the middle of another game, so that didn't happen. I got to meet the Hexy Beast, who, you know, he is just a joy to be around. He's just very jolly. Um, he just laughs a lot and, you know, talk. he makes a lot of jokes and his laughter is just kind of infectious <laughs> so he is a pleasure to be around um, I got to meet this guy named Helmar who apparently um, does some kind of work in the industry like in terms of tech work like designing websites and stuff or um, like the dice tower I think so he's from Iceland so we got to play two games with him and he was really really nice to meet um, yeah it was just nice to meet everyone like all the people who follow me on Twitter who I was able to meet and even one of them two of them I was able to play games with actually um, if I did meet you and I got your name wrong and uh, you know I'm so sorry I am terrible with names um, so I'm trying to get better at it but um, I did end up calling someone by the wrong name on a train when I saw him the next day when I was going back and I felt really bad about that um, so yeah so it was really great to meet all these people it was just so much fun and you know it made me realize like you know all these people who bully me on Twitter in America like whatever like no one cares like you go to a convention in the UK like no one cares like no one cares about these people who are bullying me they just want to see like what kind of content I create you know they had discussions with me it was just really nice to meet all these publishers and you know give them my business card it was just it was just great it was a great experience and I would love to go back to UKGE so um you know since I live there I still have a bank account in the UK um, you know and I prior to the pandemic I used to try to visit every year since I have a lot of friends there um, so yeah so I would like to try to make UKGE an annual thing of course I'm going to have to figure out how to transport board games back I had this bag that I had bought which had no wheels it's like a big like kind of weekend bag but like really roomy it's made out of cloth it's not like um, like um, like solid what do you call it like hard material it's not hard material so you know it can be like kind of like you know conform to the kind of like conform to the shape of what's in it not like entirely it's not like slime but you know what I mean so um so I put all the board games that I had bought in that and oh my god it's such a pain carrying it because it doesn't have wheels so I have to hold on to it and walk with it through the airport and you know I, I couldn't put it through baggage claim because everything would get dinged up um, and board games are hard to transport in a hard suitcase because the way that suitcases are shaped you wouldn't be able to fit much in a hard suitcase right um, even if it's a big suitcase so that's why I was really conscious about which review copies I was getting and you know how much I would have to carry like even you know by the second day there were still some games I would have loved to have grabbed and taken home with me but I knew I, I had no more space so I couldn't do it um, yeah, so overall, fantastic trip. Absolutely loved it. Um, the weather in the last few days was really crap. It rained, it was cold, but still a good trip. Uh, oh yeah, one of the highlights of my trip was having a bunch of pigeons land on me. I'll show you guys a picture here. 
that was fun. Oh, uh, Brussels. So yeah, so I met up with a local friend. So originally I had asked followers of mine if I know anyone in Bruges or Brussels to meet up with and two people did respond, but I ended up meeting up with a local friend over there instead. So we spent a day in Bruges and we ended up playing Bruges in Bruges, which was cool, but the weather that day was crap. It was rainy, it was windy, so we couldn't play outside. So it's not like I could play Bruges in like the main like square or whatever of Bruges with like all the buildings in the background as I'm playing it like that would have been amazing but no instead we played in this cafe called Cafe Rose Red which was really pretty it had like roses hanging from the ceiling um, so yeah we played Bruges um, but I'll talk about the gameplay experience next time it was my first time playing it so it's pretty cool that my first time playing the board game was in the city um, and then um, the next day we did a Alice in Wonderland escaped room, escape room in Brussels, which was awesome. So it was just the two of us. And I believe the escape room difficulty was medium or medium to difficult. And we started the escape room in two separate rooms and we had to work together to be able to reunite and then complete the rest of the puzzles together. And we did it. It was awesome. And it was such a good escape room. I absolutely loved it. It's probably one of my top three escape rooms now. I've done at least 10 escape rooms total. Uh, you know, I've done one in London, I've done a couple in New York City, and some smaller cities around the US, and now in Brussels, and that was a fantastic escape room. I highly recommend it. Um, so yeah, look up Alice in Wonderland escape room in Brussels, and if you ever get the chance, check it out. Like, like I started out in the rabbit hole, and my friend started out like in the big room, and the rabbit hole was so tiny, and stupid me at first thought that I was going to be in that tiny room for the whole thing. Like, I didn't realize that there was a trap door, and I had to figure out how to open the trap door, and it was so much simpler than I thought, and I was overcomplicating it. So stupid me, of course, was like looking around, thinking like, no, it just cannot be this easy like tapping you know typing in the word rabbit into this like phone like I just didn't think it would be that easy but it was that easy and then the door opened after I had gotten like a key that said call rabbit and then there was like a phone and I had to type in rabbit and then the door opened and then I ended up in like a narrow hallway and then I needed to figure out how to connect with my friend from this narrow hallway into the big room he was in and that was really cool and we worked together and then oh my god in the big escape room like the big part of the room there were just so many different kinds of puzzles and that's what i really like in a good escape room like i don't like just doing combination lock after combination lock and i have done rooms like that where it's just non-stop combination locks and in that in my opinion that does not make for an, a good escape room a good escape room has you solving a variety of puzzles where you know things from one side of the room might impact things on another side side of the room and this one had a lot of that and I absolutely loved it um, it was really really fantastic so yeah maybe my number one or number two escape room of all time so that was my trip it was a very good trip and I'm so glad I got to meet so many people there were so many people I needed to meet who I did not get to meet because in the second day I got caught up in the afternoon just playing board games and then I had to take my train back to London um, so I know that the uh, convention runs for three days but from previous experience at PAX Unplugged I always go to PAX Unplugged for all three days, but the third day is usually just a waste. Like I am so drained of energy by, on Sundays at PAX Unplugged. I literally don't have energy to do anything. I just basically walk around a bit like a zombie and then I just collapse on a chair, wait for my buddies to finish whatever they're doing so we can go home. So the third day of PAX Unplugged, I'm always like a zombie and just dead tired. And the most fun thing for me on the third day of a convention is what I'm going to eat. So, so, so this time I knew it wasn't worth me buying a train ticket to go to UKGE for the third day because I knew I would just be dead. And I was right, like by the time I got home on the second day, I was just so freaking exhausted, just dead tired. Um, so yeah, the second day was consisted of me just, you know, in the morning still walking around meeting publishers and then in the afternoon playing two board games and then running to catch my train. So that was that and it was a lot of fun and I hope all the people who I did not get to meet who wanted to meet me and who I wanted to meet um, that I'll meet you at the next UKGE. Like I was supposed to meet with Paul Grogan and that didn't happen which was really unfortunate. I was supposed to meet with some other Twitter friends who I absolutely love, like Ross, and I didn't get to see him. Um, just so it was really unfortunate that there were so many people who I didn't get to see who I really, really wanted to see. So I hope I'll see you guys at the next UKGE. So I don't have a question for you guys. You know, I have a lot of stuff I need to do in the next two weeks because I am leaving for Africa. 
um, on June 27th basically. My flight is super duper early on the 28th so I need to make it to New York City on the 27th and find a place to crash and yeah and I have so much to do then. So many videos to shoot. Um, in fact I didn't show you one of the games that arrived. So I'm behind on my Moonrakers expansion videos um, so I need to shoot both of those and I have a bunch of other videos I need to shoot. So my question to you is what should I do with this? <laughs> should I sell it? Should I keep it? Should I play it? Uh, what do you guys think? I don't know. Like, like I said I've played the game a number of times but not my own copy. And what should I do with Inkling? Is that a game that you guys would want to win or has my description of it totally put you off? Let me know. And let me know what you guys are up to and if you're backing anything. I would be curious. Um, I wonder if there's anything good coming out. I know that there's some super duper expensive Kickstarters out right now like Castles of Burgundy. I don't know if it's still running or if it finished but that was very expensive so I decided not to get it. And then um, of course the collector's edition of Suro which is like $500. Um, you know, if you want to get that, that's great. You know, it's like, you know, it's like basically like the cost of like five or six or seven board games combined into one. So if Suro is your favorite game and you want this amazing collector's edition of it, then good for you. Um, you should get it. But yeah, I've never played it. So I don't know if it's a good game or a bad game. And I'm just thinking, okay, that's a good question. I will ask you guys this question. If you were going to buy a really blinged out version of a board game, which board game would it be? That is a great question. Oh. Hmm, now I'm thinking, if I could buy a really blinged out version of a board game, which board game would it be? Like a collector's edition, like something really high quality, like this version of Suro. Would it be Moon? What could you do with that though? Like what could you do with Moon? Because it's a bunch of cards and then just a bunch of tokens. Um, hmm. Because it doesn't have a board. Unless you made really nice boards, like instead of play mats, unless you made like super nice boards for each player with like, you know, like recessed like slots for the cards. Maybe that would work. Huh. I don't know. Or like a really fancy version of Azul, but the chocolate version of Azul is coming out, which I really want. And I hope it comes with boards and not like that like flimsy card stock. It better come with actual boards. Um, I'm trying to think. I don't know. I don't know if there's a game I love enough that I would want like the super duper like $500 edition of it. Like even Petrocore, which I love, I can't imagine wanting like like a version of it that costs like $500. Like you know the collector's edition of Petrocore as I have it now I think is really nice as it is. I don't know. So you tell me if you had $500 to spend on a totally deluxe like you know upgraded edition of a board game which board game would it be please tell me i would love to know and until next time you guys i will be back next week um because i don't leave for africa for two weeks so you will see me next week all right thanks bye <music>